Hello, everyone. Rev Brad here. Thanks for listening to our podcast from the Touchline. Today, I want to start by asking the question, what kind of past do you have? Having been around soccer for some 20 plus years, I've met a lot of different people. Superstars of the beautiful game, nasty villains, hardworking blue collar players, prima donnas, and so many of them have a colorful, if not checkered, background and past. Especially in the years serving as a chaplain, there have been many times when so many of the men and women I've encountered are running from something in their past. Whether it was a bad experience, a failed relationship, a shattered family, an injury-plagued career, a scoring drought, or something else. Many of those in the football world arrive in a new city with a new team looking for a fresh start, looking to erase an earlier history or to regain something that has become lost to them in the midst of the game. Well, today, I want to look at what running from our past looks like and offer some encouragement to those who find themselves seemingly always looking over their shoulder. We're back after this. He's found the space and he's found the back of the net! Just a little off foot, thinking he's going to go far post. Not strong enough with his right hand. Whips that one in. Far post, almost made him in, and they have. He has the hat trick. The second in his career. The third of the night. The hat trick hero. Talked about you're not going to be able to sustain that kind of pressure. To the corner. Goes towards the near post. And you're the angle, and what a goal! What a goal! So recently, I finished watching the Netflix docudrama entitled The English Game. I actually was able to convince my wife to watch the show with me because the series was written by Downton Abbey's Julian Fellows. Well, The English Game follows the story of Fergus Souter, a Scottish footballer from Glasgow who ends up playing for a couple English clubs and is today recognized as perhaps the first professional football player, or the first one to be paid if you try and understand what that means. Now, the Netflix show is historically inaccurate. You can look it up on the web. It depicts Suter playing for the wrong club team, and I'm not sure how accurate the other elements of Suter's life are that are portrayed in the show, but there certainly is a ring of truth to what we see depicted in Fellows' story, at least it kept a bit of my wife's attention, as it paints a brushstroke where we see Suter running from difficulty in his past, namely an abusive and alcoholic father. At a key moment in the story, Suter is encouraged by a friend that he is not his father. And even though confronted with his past and unable to run any further from it, Suter must also decide whether he can accept this encouragement from a friend, whether he can truly change and move on. True story? I don't know. But it certainly resonates with many in football and even without, that we often find ourselves running from a past, with its various shades of shame, ill repute, questions, and more that seem to follow us and dog our every step. In reflecting on Suter in the way that we often are faced with a past that seems to follow us, it made me think of someone in the Bible who had his own historical demons and had to deal with working through what he once was. And until he did, it would never allow him to move on and become the man that God intended him to be. Allow me to share for the next few minutes some insights from the life of a man who we know today as the Apostle Paul. Well, the first thing, Paul was actually named Saul. We're first introduced to him at the end of Acts chapter 7. This is Luke's account of the beginnings of the early church. Saul is present at the stoning of Stephen. Stephen was an early leader in the Christian church, and he's the first Christian martyr. We know a couple things about Saul here at this point in Acts chapter 7. First, he's young. And the second thing is he's approving of Stephen's murder. It's a few verses later that we see that Saul is actually in the active activity of destroying the early church. He's perhaps single-handedly behind a great outbreak of persecution for those early Christians, and he dragged many men and women off to prison. The second thing we know about Saul is that he's very passionate and committed. We see him in chapter 9, pursuing with religious zeal more attacks on the church. He goes, he's, he's kind of weeded out Jerusalem, and he goes and gets official permission to carry on his quest to arrest and destroy this Christian movement in areas outside of Jerusalem. So he begins to strategically expand his campaign. But all of a sudden, Saul encounters Jesus and his life is forever changed. It's in this moment, this Damascus Road moment, that Saul is struck with a blindness. And we see him sitting and waiting, not even eating for three days. His blindness is finally lifted when a Christian believer named Ananias reluctantly and cautiously comes and puts his hands on Saul and he is filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Saul hangs out for a number of days and then he starts preaching. He's totally flipped sides, totally changed teams, and now he's applying all the zeal and passion and training of who he is to the other team, to the other side. If I could liken it to any football story, it would be like Messi playing for Barca one day and then after a short weekend, suiting up for Real Madrid's next match, flipping the, sw- flipping the script. Of course, Saul's flip means that no one really trusts him, neither the Jewish religious leaders nor the young upstart Christians known simply as the way. Saul ends up spending three years in the desert. His name ends up being changed to Paul, and he ends up writing nearly 25% of what comprises the New Testament in today's Christian Bible. It's an amazing transformation, one that could only happen if Jesus is involved. But still, Paul has a past, and we read about it in several of his writings. Let me share a few observations. First, Paul carries the consequences and pain of his past. We know from an account of Acts that Paul suffers a blindness that lasts three days. But it seems that the impacts may have had longer-lasting results or longer-lasting effect. We learn uh, about that, Paul having a thorn in the flesh. He writes in a letter to the church at Corinth, uh, the letter, the second letter, entitled 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. And we see that he writes about this thorn in the flesh that he prays for it to be taken away. But Jesus says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. You can get through this. Now, we don't know for sure if this is a reference to the physical ailment of blindness or, or loss of sight. Maybe there's another kind of adversary that's in Paul's life that, that Paul's referring to here in this writing. But we do know that many of Paul's letters are written by an emancioasis, a type of writing assistant. His vision impairment would have been hard when it came to writing letters to the different churches and people that he had visited. So he often employed someone else to help him write his letters. And sometimes he would sign his letters or he would say in his letters, he would say, see, see what large script or large handwriting I used to, to write these words. It was, it was like Paul putting his, his official stamp, his official signature, his, his own writing onto the, to the scroll or the parchment paper that was used. The second thing we know about Paul is that Paul has a certain amount of guilt or grief about his past. After all, he was there at the death of Stephen. He did a lot of harm to perhaps many good people, and he probably realizes this later after his conversion. In his letter to his protege, Timothy, he describes himself as chief or worst of sinners. You can read that in 1 Timothy 1.15. So we see that Paul has had to work through issues of forgiveness, forgiving uh, himself Uh, having and receiving forgiveness from others, forgiveness even from Jesus. He realizes that on that road to Damascus, Jesus says, why, why, Paul? Why, Saul? Why, Saul? Why are you persecuting me? And so Paul has had to do this hard work of reconciling his past. And we see Paul's reconciling work as he lists out his his credentials, and, and he has them all. He was religiously devout and zealous. He was born in the right tribe, the right clan. He was perfect in all his ways. But Paul learns that none of this was worth anything in comparison to knowing Jesus, to truly knowing Jesus as his Lord. And so we learn in Philippians 3 that everything that Paul could have taken pride in, everything that he kind of could have had in his account or his portfolio to, to brag about, all those things in the past, those things become reduced. And he now has reframed and reprioritized what is important in life. And so Paul goes on to write some of my favorite words in the New Testament when he writes this in Philippians 3. He says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let me read that again. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What I love about those words is that we see Paul moving beyond a past that might have stopped and and stymied him. Paul goes beyond a past riddled with guilt, uh, guilt from a wrongful death and murder, a, a past which saw him zealous and legalistic and religious for all the wrong reasons. And and for really the wrong faith, the wrong aim, the wrong direction. It was a past, his was a past in which he hurt many people. It was a past that he eventually had to leave behind. And we see in Paul, even in these words, an arc, 
a heaven-bound, upward-facing directional arc of his life in which he sees and comprehends that his past, even with how painful and messy and dark and difficult it was, it's a past being redeemed by God. It's a past being used by God to bring about something greater and grander for the kingdom. In fact, Jesus' words to Ananias are, go and visit Paul, Saul, and touch him and heal him because I have appointed him and he's going to be my messenger. He's on my team and I've picked him. Well, friend, I don't know about your past. I don't know how messy or difficult the things that you have in your past or that you're running from. But I do know this. If Paul lays claim to being the worst of sinners, you know, I don't know, would there ever be a, a GOT, a greatest of all time of sin? Well, if Paul lays claim to being that worst or chiefest of sinners, well, then you and I have a chance. We have a chance that our past cannot be as bad. We can have a hope that Jesus can take our messy past and turn it into something beautiful, something good. And if Jesus can take someone like Saul, Paul, and flip him as the biblical messy of his day, then he can certainly take you and me. And whatever's in our past, he can redeem and restore it into something good. Now, we may not be writing 25% of the Bible, but you can bet it might come awfully close to, to being something as great and grand as that. Well, in closing, I want to pray a prayer for those of us running from a past. Whether it's a past of pain and abuse, or a past where emerging from certain circumstances, or certain sin, or certain shame... And I want to encourage you to reflect on the life of a man once named Saul, but someone who became Paul, a man who once glowed and, and was excited at the execution and murder of a man, but eventually became one of the greatest followers of Jesus and suffered his own death for his faith, a man who left the past behind for a new day, for becoming a new creation in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, forgetting what's behind is hard. Forgiving myself is maybe even harder, and all I can seem to do is run and run and run away from a past of sin and shame. Lord, help me stop running. Help me to take hold of the new vision, the new hope, the new person that you believe, that you know that I can be. Help me to press on and to find that heaven-bound arc of my life. Encounter me on the road. Bring someone to help heal my blindness and restore me. Bring someone to introduce me to the other side, the other team. And may I live in all that you have made me and desired me to be, even though I be in the starting 11 for greatest sinners of all time. Amen. Well, this is Reb Brad coming to you from the Touchline.